Hi, you're watching a very special session of Agenda Wani because it's not easy to get into this kind of meet. It's called the World Comic Forum ASEAN and it is here in Hanoi, in Vietnam. This is the 27th edition and uh, you know, back home in Malaysia, people keep saying sometimes that WF is elitist, that and this. But for me, it's very simple. Here is a meet, even at the ASEAN level, where multiple stakeholders, diverse group of people, you can meet the top CEO of Fortune 500 companies or the Prime Minister or President of a country. Same time, you can meet somebody who's just started a techno startup with only three people, and you also have the NGOs and the CSOs. But in between that, I have discovered an artist, <laughs> somebody who write and can pen award-winning novels, Google Illustrator, you get what I mean? But I have to introduce him by his very dignified title, Assistant Professor of New York University in Abu Dhabi, Miguel, how do I say it right, the Chinese way, Sihuko. Perfect. Thank you so Thank much. You. You know, I must confess, and my producer reminded me of this, I actually have met uh, and known of Miguel uh, earlier because he was there at the 26th edition in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, mm -hmm. and uh, was actually trekking up Uncle Wat in his khaki pants and being very okay. urban, <laughs> Asian about it. But uh, I want to bring all that into point because I want to start and share with you guys in case you missed it. Miguel was actually with me in a session at WF ASEAN at the place called the Arena. It's like a gladiator ring, you know, 360, audience all around us. And we had to talk about whether the diversity, the richness of culture, language, religion that we have, is it seriously under threat now? Is it withering? So let's start with that a bit, Miguel, because it's still fresh in our mind. Sure. And, um, your fellow panelists in that session, John Riadi of the Lipo Group of Indonesia said that, you know, has always been there, this power of diversity, and it has always been under threat. Mm -hmm. But you're the artist and also the intellect, a journalist like me also, so many hats that you wear. So this time I can let you define it a bit, pluralism, but I want you to give that context because I've never seen it as being under threat because I've always been looking at it as being the gel that makes us special. I mean, when I discovered through literature and new findings that Malacca as a port in its heyday was three times the size of Venice. Mm -hmm. I mean, so diversity worked for us. Our forefathers were very openly trading with one another despite that conflict between empires and whatever mm -hmm. else. So I would like your take on it. Yes, go ahead and define sure. it. You're the assistant professor. but. I, I, Go for it. I think we need to make a distinction between diversity and pluralism. You know, we are certainly a very diverse region. The Philippines itself, where I come from, you know, we have more than 80 languages and dialects. Um, you know, our, our Philippine history is, is, is Spanish, American, Malay, Chinese, and, and, you know, even in my blood, all of those uh, ethnicities are, are present. So we're very diverse, um, dozens and dozens of, of different ethnic uh, and tribal groups. But in terms of pluralism, you know, I think that that's a very different thing. In ASEAN, you know, we might be diverse, but are we pluralistic? And the way I, I think it's important to, to approach this question is to de define pluralism. And to me, pluralism is this concept or idea or ideal, and because it's an ideal, that means it's a, it's a goal that we're always seeking, uh, but maybe never will uh, attain. It, it's, a, it's a goal in which all sectors of society are, give, are able to access power um, and representation and equality um, equally, uh, meaning no one ethnic group, religious group, political group has complete dominance over the other ones. Uh, more so even, um, no groups feel that they are silenced, censored, oppressed. And I think the question we have to ask in the Philippines and, and across the ASEAN region is, are there groups who feel that they are? And I think if we're very honest with ourselves and we look at the types of governments we have, 
in the region, absolutely there are repressive regi regimes that seek to control the media, which is a very important tool for minority groups or, or, or dissenters to be able to speak their voice and advocate for their, for their causes and, 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 and demand their rights. Um, we have religious divisions that are taken by politicians to, and used to create uh, uh, tension and, and to get votes. Um, we have dynasties that create a political atmosphere so that the regular citizen, like you and me, is unable to ever partake in the political process. So, you know, when we think of pluralism as, uh, in that regard, are we really a pluralistic region? Do we have pluralistic societies? I say no, obviously not. And I think the question isn't so much, is pluralism under threat in Asia? I think we can say it absolutely is, it has been, um, regardless of how diverse we are. I think the question is, isn't, is pluralism under threat? The question is, why do our people are people so willing to give it up? And why? And where I come from, in the Philippines now, we have a, a political regime that has been very effective in silencing the opposition uh, on social media, for example. I've, I've, I've been the victim of this. If I say something against uh, the president, I get attacked. Hundreds and hundreds of people um, uh, insulting me, insulting my family. Uh, th threatening violence, you know. So are we having this open conversation that is essential to a pluralistic society? No, we're not because the, the powers that be are using these new technologies to really silence dissent, um, to go after media, critical media companies, um, to, to, to try to silence also opposition figures. In the Philippines we have uh, senators who have been jailed or, or there are attempts now to jail more. Uh, simply because they present uh, opposing, dissenting political ideas uh, and advocacies. Uh, and that to me is frightening. But looking at it from the other side, you know, for a group of people whose forefathers were doing things one way, and then suddenly there's this first group of uh, globalis globalist uh, invaders, put it that way, who came from Europe and changed the borders and the ethnic composition and the population. And even, like in Malaysia, uh, ethnic groups are divided into different economic uh, activities and areas, for example. And even six decades after, it's not easy to engineer that socially to be different. So, from that argument, some groups will see that as, hey, we're not doing it for any other reason. Because we've been robbed for the longest time, 500 over years. Mm -hmm. And suddenly now with all these things and the fourth industrial revolution, we're going to be eroded some more. Our identity, uh, the land that we used to have, the economic cake that we used to have. So, but it's easy to see it from a Western narrative point of view where, you know, um, is the ultra-conservative uh, staying to their true racial tendencies or religious tendencies. So, I don't know if I'm making sense to an assistant professor of <laughs> literacy, for example, but uh, what I'm saying is, maybe we need to understand why, if we say they're giving up that choice to be oh, yeah. plural, and maybe we need to understand why some people feel insecure and they f find the need to build walls of defense. Oh, absolutely. Right? You know? So let's go for the first break. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give you a chance to answer that because I want to link that, you know, we cannot solve all in one discussion. But what I can do is, I want to draw your attention as the viewers to Miguel's strength that is narrative. Because a lady pointed that out during my session with Miguel and others before that pluralism doesn't have a sexy, if I may add, super, super cool idol and voice. You know, it, it just get maybe 
swarmed by all the other narratives of negativity and protectionism and whatever else. So the right person to ask is the cool assistant professor of NYU in Abu Dhabi right after this break. You know, because in Malaysia, yeah, we're starting to be like Europe because of what happened on May 9. <laughs> Hi, and you're still watching a very specially recorded session of Agenda Wani right here at the World Comic Forum ASEAN in Hanoi, Vietnam for 2018. And uh, I want to pick up where the first segment was leading to, which is um, you defined pluralism for us from your point of view. And um, I just want to go to the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. People that, uh, you know, we were alluding to before that they were giving up that choice to be plural, mm -hmm. whether for self, family, or society, or nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, people always do things for a reason. But yeah. I'm saddened to think that we are aping, in that sense, uh, the Western powers that we criticize so much. Because in Europe, it's pretty clear. You have the Nationalist Party in France, in Germany, Gerd Wilder, oh my God, he burned the Quran and everything else. When the French football team couldn't have won without having people who are not, you know, yeah. the majority. So, um, I know you make the distinction between diversity and pluralism, but I want to tie it up with people being insecure. And when they felt insecure, they moved back to what they know. I understood, yeah. Of course. And, you know, I've lived in Singapore. I, I, I teach now in the Middle East. Uh, these are not democracies. And you look at their, their societies and you think, wow, fantastic, you know, look at what they've achieved by not having the dirtiness of democracy, of having to change um, party all the time and go back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, these are perhaps, you know, one way of putting it would be benevolent dictatorships. Okay. Singapore certainly is. Same ruling party, same family for the past uh, 60 years. But the question, and that's well and good, if the dictator or the ruling party or whoever, the, uh, the dynasties, are benevolent. But what happens when they're no longer the benevolent? What happens when one of them gets sick, as happened with the, the Marcoses? Uh, Ferdinand Marcos got sick and everything started to fall apart. Uh, what happens if they become abusive, if they become corrupt, like what happened in Malaysia? Right? Um, how, do, what do we do, how do we get rid of these people? if we no longer have the mechanisms of democracy to oust them properly, without having to go into the streets, without having to start a revolution. We no longer have that. If they control the Supreme Court, and they control the legislature, and parliament, and all, all of that, and the media, we have no mechanism anymore as regular citizens to oust these, or replace them democratically. And so we're forced to, to bloodshed, we're forced to protest, we're forced to endure decades and decades, perhaps, uh, of, of this regime. And if you look at all of these, country, uh, these countries in the ASEAN, really how many of them are, are democracies? Even the Philippines isn't a democracy. It is Asia's oldest democracy, but it's a dictatorship of dynasties. It really is. 80% of our elected positions are, are dynasties. And so if you're a regular person and you want to advocate for your community, you want to enter politics, you have good ideas, you know, our constitution, our, democ our democracy says that any citizen can join and participate and give back to society in that way. But the truth is it's impossible because we don't have leaders, we have rulers. Okay. The rulers okay. have such point. a stranglehold on the system. And so I don't think it's a Western thing at all. It really is just a, sa a safety net. It's the checks and balance against abusive authority. S but that wall, the 80% privilege mm -hmm. area that the rest have to sc take scraps within that 20%, let's say, that's being disrupted by the fourth industrial revolution, like it or not, because they can't control that. 
Yeah, well, it, absolutely. So we have all of these new technologies. We have all of this wealth. But at the same time, the technologies are being used by the rulers to legitimize, to, to spread propaganda, to, to, to attack their opponents or anybody who, who tries to threaten, uh, even legally and politically, their, their, their position. Uh, we also have economic affluence, which is fantastic. It's, it's, it's giving people jobs, it's putting food on the table. You know, that's not a, that can never be a bad thing. But it's also making people comfortable. And so we're selling our, our potential to participate and challenge authority as citizens. For, and we're giving up rights. We're giving up human rights. We're giving up uh, all the, the access to checks and balances. Because now we have these malls, and now we can buy Prada and Louis Vuitton, and now you know, we have education, and all of these things. So uh, as I said, what happens when it turns? Where do we, where, how do we fix this? How do we attack these, these, these people who become abusive? OK, I want to paint a picture. And uh, because usually RT, so it's easier for me to take um, example from Hollywood or you know, popular culture. And uh, if you look at the drama series and everything else, when they embody the spirit of the fourth industrial revolution, like Internet of Things, Big Data, data analytics, sentiment analysis, you know, senses in everything. They always tie it to the plot of that vested interest or the elite people in business or in power or some shadowy group mm -hmm. that controls things using this technology. I'll give you an example. Um, in Homeland, for example, the drama series, I don't know whether you watch it or not, Data analytics was used to play around with the results of the election or influence the results of the election. Yeah. Which, surprise, surprise, if you read news across the world, is what is being debated from the Panama disclosure papers, mm -hmm. right? Until Julian Assange and what he's trying to say. So, for me, we can't control that, you know, between you and me, but what we do have influence over is that information and the literature that the information appears in. Mm -hmm. And I promised the narrative, so I'm leading to my second yes. break. So this is where I'm selling you first the question for the last segment. Let's just do what we can do. We can control narrative. We can produce new narrative. We can make it sexy. We can make it, even though it's the minority voice, but the most resounding voices where it matters. So I'm going to tap into your academic intellect on that plus the award-winning novelies and other stuff because I think what's wrong with going back to novels and books to talk about terrorism to talk about you know yeah. fighting for the bottom 40 percent let's bring it back if you so much want it to be sexy in form put it in ebook or you know put a mini webisode or whatever on your timelines so let's discuss that after this short break <laughs> A lot of uh, the regular Agenda Awani fans and viewers would remember Dr. Farish Noor. I have Dr. Farish Noor in a more younger Filipino version. <laughs> and also, as an NYU assistant professor, Miguel Sihuko is with me. And uh, we want to change the narrative. At least that's the last points, among the last points of our session, you know, even from the crowd. And it was so empowering. And, uh, the question from the crowd make this point that, um, hey, you're talking about pluralism, but what's the sexy message of that? You know, it's being sort of drowned with other messages. Uh, and I would like to put this to those who have followed again now that you would know some of this. You know, my uh, our fellow journalist editor, um, uh, he was the only. Uh, in Middle East, he was, was the only one who interviewed Osama bin Laden two times. 
So, but he saw in his book called The Digital Caliphate about IS or Daesh, he saw it coming. When you read the book, you know, because you can link what happened to what is now Iraq and everything, and you see the vacuum created. But the thesis of his book is very simple. Why IS, ISIS or Daesh get so much following is because they knew. They used digital tech to the max. So to him, it's the digital caliphate, not, not territorial so much. Yes. And uh, you know, Gran Turismo, the game, yes. they have their version, you know, spewing their icons and propagandas. Mm -hmm. So let's take a leaf out of that. Yes. And why can't we have champions and champion narratives of pluralism? If we look at history, we'll see that the new technology gets co-opted by the ones who have power and wealth to be able to use it. So you look at Nazi Germany. Radio was a new way of disseminating, disseminating information, of telling the story of, the, of Germany, uh, of telling the story that, vilify, that identified a, 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 a group to vilify, the Jews. And Joseph Go Goebbels actually knew this and was very, Hitler's propaganda minister, was very effective at taking this new technology and using it well and effectively. It's the same thing as happened under the dictator Ferdinand Marcos. We had 22 years of the dictatorship. It was terrible. Thousands of people died. You know, uh, our, our economy tanked. Uh, but he controlled the narrative by having the media, by um, becoming a patron of the arts. When you're a patron of the arts, you support those who are sympathetic and you repress or, or sentence to silence those who are against you. And so we see how the powers that be will take these things, censor you, and amplify their own messages. But what's very exciting to me now is that we have the internet, we have social media, we have all these new tools that although now it seems they are being co-opted for fake news and, 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 and troll farms and all of that, um, it is still something that we can access and if we learn how to use it properly, because it is a tool, a tool can be used as a weapon, yeah. but it can also be used to build. Yeah. Uh, and increasingly it seems that, that people are telling their own narratives using social media, but really it's, it's just a form of what I do as a novelist, as a journalist. I, I'm a contributing opinion editor for the International New York Times and I always try to tell the story of, of what's happening in the Philippine society to try to understand it. So what I've done as a citizen, as a journalist, uh, and I encourage everybody to do, is instead of just swallowing what the government is telling us, for example, the drug war that we have now, we now have uh, the ability to take our phones, uh, to find access, to go to the, to, into the streets, interview people, uh, go to the crime scenes, um, talk to the, to, to the drug uh, um, addicts, you know, really get a sense of what's happening yourself, record it, share it amongst yourselves, start that conversation, rather than just swallowing what the government or the partisan media is, is giving us. So we now have the ability to do that, to, to not just tell our own stories, but to also investigate the stories of others properly and, and get it down on, on, on video and, and share it with everybody. To me, that's very exciting. Literature is just, uh, whether it's a novel or, or uh, poetry, these are all just conversations between the ages. You know, when we, we, when we read Shakespeare, yeah. we're conversing with Shakespeare. But it's the same thing as watching the news. It's the same thing as engaging people uh, in civil discussion on, on Facebook. Uh, we're just really having a conversation across borders and across the ages. I mean, I couldn't sum up a better point than that. And we don't tell our story. Correct. The powers that be will tell our story for us. Yes. And Miguel can even do that powerfully in a novel. Maybe just fictitious, uh, fictitious characters or <laughs> even plot lines, but it carries meaning. That's, and people are intelligent idea. enough yeah. to make the connection. Thank you so much, Miguel, Thank you very for much. making time. You My know, pleasure. One year after our Angkor Wat adventure. But, um, you have to promise me that if ever you're in Malaysia, you're going to have a live seat in my studio. Absolutely. For the and audience. then we'll go for Rajak, which yes. is my favorite. And I want to ask you to go and talk to our young ones in school. Yes, please. Because hardly anyone talks about novel writing or rhetoric or debate anymore.
thank you so much for tuning in. This has been a very inspiring discussion with Mihel Sihuko. Uh, mixed DNA, you know, but practically Filipino in a sense. <laughs> and uh, assistant professor at NYU in Abu Dhabi. WF ASEAN 2018, Kamaru Baran with producer Fida and cameraman Rizal signing off for Agenda 1. Thank you.